Now, before we begin, did everyone get their sermon illustration? If you don't have one of these, you'd like to participate during the sermon, you can raise your hand. We've got ushers that will bring them to you. Just keep your hand up until they bring it. Um, I just want to begin, I saw some of you during the gospel reading, and even maybe during the epistle, kind of making some faces. You know, this is one of those weeks as a pastor, when you get to the the liturgical calendar, and you see the readings for the week, you think, there is no easy text to preach on this week. I don't want to preach. Both of these are hard scriptures. But the reality is, our reality is not always puppy dogs and fairy tales, is it? Life is hard. And so we have texts like this to wrestle with, just like we wrestle with things in life. But the point is, As Christians, even though we're not exempt from the hardships of life, we do have the ability to respond differently. That can be an example to children and to the world around us. Our texts and our epistle readings this morning have, um, in the gospel, have two overarching themes. You've got this idea of personal holiness, but also corporate holiness within the church. And so my goal this morning and what I hope to explain is life is like a prickly pear. Will you all open in prayer with me? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence here this morning. And we ask, Lord, for your spirit to minister to us. Lord, for those who are hurting, Lord, may we pray for them. Lord, may we seek out, Lord, to, to really bring healing in this church and this world. And Lord, we pray for those um, who couldn't be with us this morning, just protect them. And Lord, we pray for those um, who have walked away from your church, that you will bring them home. And Lord, bless this time as we open your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You know, in our gospel reading this morning, we encounter a very bold statement of this personal responsibility to holiness. Jesus says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Wow. It kind of stops us in our tracks. Jesus is pretty serious about not causing others to stumble. And our gospel continues last week's reading. If you remember, the disciples were arguing over Who is the greatest? Probably walking along that road behind Jesus going, did you remember that healing I did last week? I'm the greatest. And what does Jesus do? He sits them down and he begins to teach them and he says, if anyone would be first, he must be last and servant of all. And then he takes a child and he places it in his arms around him and he tells them, whoever receives such a child in my name receives me and not only me but the one who sent me. It's interesting, I was reading, I'd never heard this before, William Lane's commentary on Mark, in the Aramaic language, a language Jesus often spoke, the word for child and servant is the same. Jesus was saying to the disciples that they must receive the children, also meaning every servant or disciple, like he received this child with open arms and love. He continues this thought in our text when he says, whoever causes one of these little ones to sin, he's probably meaning a double entendre here, meaning whoever actually causes a child to sin who believes in him, or those who are new, are young in the Christian faith. That there's a responsibility of the mature believers not to cause any of them to stumble. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, When we confess that he is Lord and we receive his grace, we are saved. Meaning that we have everything that we need for eternal salvation. We believe in Jesus. However, at the same time, we begin something. We begin this process that we become more holy. Or that's the point, to become more holy, to become more Christ-like every day. To look more and more like the sun. This is a process called sanctification. Now, all of us here, as believers, are along this journey of sanctification. But we're all in different places. 
as James will tell us, but there is a personal responsibility that we must invite God in, that we have to invite the Holy Spirit to come do his work in us, to make us more in the image of Christ. In other words, we have to do our thing to let him do his thing. We say, God, come in and remodel my inside. This being said, we're all at different places. But here, the disciples, just before this, were arguing, who is the greatest? And Jesus tells them, if anyone would be first, he must be last and servant of all. In other words, no one is a better Christian because they're in a different place in their sanctification process. All Christians are equal. So all must serve equally. You serve all Christians. But we're also called to admonish one another. We have in Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in wisdom, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So we have discipleship, we have accountability, all of these are healthy things. But we have to make sure and we must be confident that we are in tune with the Holy Spirit, that we are listening, that we are receiving sanctification from the Spirit versus sanctimonious sanctification by our own humanness. What does God want? What is He doing? What is He calling me to change, to, to take out? In other words, listen to the Spirit. We have responsibility. And we have this vision for our church. You might have heard it, that God is going to raise up oaks of righteousness. Isaiah 61 says, They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planning of the Lord for the display of his splendor. But great oaks, we know, they don't grow overnight. That these oaks are going to take time and patience. And yet we look around, we already have so many oaks of righteousness in St. Clement's here in our pews. We look back in the hundreds of years of history and all the oaks of righteousness that have gone before and God's doing it again. He's going to raise up oaks of righteousness to continue making St. Clement's a beacon of light in the Rio Grande community. But the thing to remember is that they don't, it doesn't always look the same. It may look a little different. That God does what he needs to do to accomplish his purpose and his kingdom work. And we see this in our gospel. You know, the disciples, they're concerned because they see others who are doing things differently than they do it. They're not followers. They're not part of Jesus' inner circle. And John says, teacher, we saw someone casting out a demon in your name and we told him to stop because he wasn't one of us. And Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterward speak evil against me. For the one who is not against us is for us. I look at this and I realize these disciples had a bad case of we are always rightous. These symptoms, they look like this. Believe as I believe, no more, no less, that I am right and no one else confess. Feel as I feel, think as I think, look as I look, and drink as I drink. Oh, I'm sorry, I messed it up. Feel as I feel, think as I think, eat what I eat, and drink what I drink. Look as I look, and do as I do, then and only then I'll fellowship with you. And Jesus wanted the disciples to understand that his followers weren't always going to look the same. That they all loved him, but they'd look a little different. And we see this even from the early church. That you had Paul and Peter who differed on theological issues. They wrestled with it, and they talked, and they came to an agreement of how to follow Christ in the best way. But you also have in 1 Corinthians, where people were arguing they were saying, I'm a follower of Paul. And others would say, well, I follow Apollos. And, Jesus, and, and, and they're saying, aren't you just acting like people of the world if you're saying, I follow this person or this? That the foundation was Jesus. But Jesus knew that there is beauty 
in diversity in the kingdom of God. And we won't always view things the same way, but the foundation must be in him. And I, I absolutely love, I love that I'm looking out at you guys and that through all of our church services, we have so many different types of people. We span many generations, socioeconomical backgrounds. We have a Spanish-speaking service, differing opinions on social justice, immigration, and perspectives of current, national, and even global issues. The one thing in common, the one commonality I truly believe at heart is that most of us, if not all of us, love Jesus. Now that's not saying that in our diversities there's not a lot of difficulties. The reality is we're going to have some difficulties, especially within the diversity. In fact, I think it's going to take in the future a lot of really directed and intentional dialogue, you know, talking about these differences without distress. And how do we do that? We remember and remind each other we are brothers and sisters in Christ and we walk away loving each other. And I'm not just talking about St. Clement's here. The church, capital C, has to be the first to bring this healing within itself in order to go out and bring healing in our community and in our world. And where, do, where and how does this happen? Like first let's talk about the where. If the church needs healing, it begins with the self. That Jesus is really really telling the disciples and he's warning us that we cannot be a stumbling block to others. And he expresses this necessity and this personal holiness in a very drastic way. Actually talking about the removal of hands of a, a foot or an eye. And some of you probably heard that scripture and you think, Jesus really said that? But he wasn't asking us to remove like that's a physical obliteration he wants a spiritual elimination he's saying get rid of the things that cause you to stumble that might cause others to stumble in their spiritual walk in their process of becoming more holy all of these things encompass the totality of life you have the hand everything we do the eyes everything we see and we feed and put into our minds and our feet everywhere we go. And I think if James had his say, he would add the tongue. Everything we say, especially relevant today, are the things we sing, do they cause other believers to stumble? You know, whoever we are, whether we're in the military, whether we're retired, whether we're teachers, doctors, we're in a hospital campus or a campus that includes our home, God calls us to be influences, godly influences. And when Jesus spoke here of protecting the beliefs of these little ones, parents and grandparents, our little ear antennas should start going off. That we have this personal responsibility that these kids and grandkids, that they're watching everything we do, they see and they hear. We have a major responsibility in our personal holiness for what they see that we are witnessing to God and who he is. I asked Kelly permission to share this because it's a comical example of my point of how much children are watching. You know, our dog, Macy, can have the most ear-piercing, decibel-damaging, nerve-nudging bark you have ever heard. And it comes out of nowhere. Literally, she can be this furry and faint dog to ferocious and fortissimo in like nanoseconds. For five years, not once have we not jumped when we're caught off guard with her bark. So sweet angel Kelly reacts with a mighty, like just a quick snap. Well, about six months ago, even when the dog wasn't doing anything wrong, Colton starts randomly looking at the dog going, mighty. Like, <laughs> like, Kelly's like, You know, during God's working on us, we have to be careful that we're not causing the children, those who are new and young in their faith, to stumble and to fall. And Jesus adds this nugget of knowledge. He says, for everyone will be salted with fire. You know, if, 
if you would have asked my opinion, I, I would have said, maybe we should write that we're going to be flogged with feathers from heaven. <laughs> like salted with fire. That's, that sounds terrible. But Jesus' words stand. I mean, it means we're going to have trials. There's going to be fire. Things aren't always going to be easy. But we must maintain this holiness so we don't cause ourselves and others to stumble. You know, I'm going to be humble and honest here. Kelly and I probably recently have not been the most model parents. More like we've been model clay parents, just being squished one way or another by things and little trials in life. And we all have them. Hear me when I say this. We're not like any worse off. Everyone has trials in their lives. But we really started letting these little things get to us. You know, the first was that we have this two-year-old fridge that just stopped working. Three months ago, so four months into customer service with Samsung, I have literally questioned if I can maintain Christian character anymore. (laughs) And then we started losing sleep, literally, because our adjustable bed got stuck in the upright position a couple weeks ago. (laughs) And then my life finally became a wreck last Thursday, literally when a speeding driver lost control of her car going the opposite direction and jumped the median into me and my truck. Life is like a prickly pear. You know, let me explain. This past Thursday, about six hours after the automobile accident, I went to the Thursday Night Life group. And Esme Hanna brought prickly pear as an appetizer. Now, I had never had one of these. So I thought, after I tasted this, this needs to be an experience we all share together here. (laughs) So before you eat it, I want to explain our little communion of cacti here. As we take this together, I'm going to warn you, the seeds are very hard. In fact, you will not be able to chew them up. You don't have to eat this, but I'm, I'm telling you in case you do. You chew, you let the fruit separate from the seeds, you swallow the fruit, and then the real cacti eaters swallow the seeds. Or you can spit them out. But let's take 30 seconds if you want to participate in the cacti communion. We can... How many of you, is this their first time with prickly pear? Okay, quite a few of you. I'm seeing some interesting faces being made out there. So Esme warned me, just like I warned you guys, those seeds are hard. I thought in my head, I can chew these up. When my jaw was jarred by those little seeds of steel, I realized, I'm not getting through these bad boys. They're not going to chew up. And I think so much this is how people view hardships in life. They hit those hardships and they think, I can't get through this. They lose hope and they give up. But if you keep going, like this prickly pear, you start to taste sweetness. And you realize, huh, this this is good. This is nice. And you begin tasting a little bit more. And the fruit separates from those hard trials, from the seeds. And you begin enjoying it. And then finally, the fullness of the flavor comes and you taste the goodness. But to experience that good stuff, the good stuff, you have to go through those hard things. And as one, they, they come together. You must go through the hard to get to the good. And the same is true about life. Jesus says that we will be salted with fire. Salt is good. The fire is the trial, the hardship. He's saying in order to be made good, you're going to have to go through these trials if you come through them and you're still salty. It says salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. How do you eat 
the same thing or how do you experience trials and two people come out very different it's about posture it's about our position that makes the difference you know I had one of these moments a couple weeks ago where we had a really long summer a lot of amazing ministry happened and so I felt like I needed to take a couple days off and just be home with Kelly and the kids and catch up on some honeydew lists and unfortunately Kelly and the kids got sick so Kelly was in bed, I had Colton duty, and I was just in a major funk. And I was, didn't know why, but I started thinking about and remembering things about my childhood. And I don't know why these came to my mind. I started thinking about how ordinary sticks became play guns, and cardboard boxes became robot costumes, and couches could become forts for a day. And then I was thinking about it, and here I am with my boy, and I was like, I'm going to teach Colton how to make a couch fort. So we did. And I, the life lesson for him, I want him to understand, is you can see the world for what it is right in front of you, or you can choose to make it different. And the same is true for all of us. Like a prickly pear, we can focus so much on the hard things that we miss the sweetness of Jesus all around us. I'll just use one of those little things I talked about, those minor inconveniences, those trials, that we were facing as an example. So I was at the Central Life Group the night before on Wednesday night, and then I woke up and I knew I had the Upper Valley Life Group that night on Thursday night. Well, normally, I take the kids on Thursdays, but Kelly had to work from the church on Thursday as well, and so she was a little frustrated because I was running slow. And she said, well, I guess since I'm ready, I'll take the kids. Praise God, she took the kids. What a God thing that I didn't have the kids with me in the truck. And then Kelly said when I called her, and I said, Kelly, I've been in an accident, but I'm okay. She said her heart melted a little bit because the night before she had read from one of her college roommates that she had lost her husband in a car accident. I mean, praise the Lord that amongst our little hardships, the sweetness of Jesus around us. And how true is it for all of us? I mean, we've been tasting the sweetness a little bit more these last few days rather than those seeds of hardness. And that leads us to how do we bring healing in our lives into the church? And James 5 tells us it's through praise and through prayer. If anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. If he is cheerful, let him pray, sing songs. If any is sick, let him call out to the elders to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. I love this because everything begins and ends in prayer, and it's sandwiched with praise. It's the posture of being on your knees before the Father that gives us the perspective to see through His eyes and see the sweetness, not the hardship. I want to close on verse 16. There is so much in James 5. I mean, that needs to be a sermon in itself with just what those prayers mean and what does that look like. But just given like where we're at and where I wanted to go with the sermon, it says, I have spoken, I'm sorry, I have spoken so much on the personal holiness and letting God do his thing in us, but then there's this idea of corporate holiness, the church. Verse 16 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book Life Together talks about this idea of confession and communion, that they go hand in hand. As he lived in this community of, of believers, he talked about this practice of mutual confession. Primary among them, he says, is the isolation that sin brings, that sin drives Christians apart and produces a hellish isolation and a deadening autonomy. He says, sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him and the more divisive and destructive it is within the church. And this is why we have to dialogue with each other, even if it's difficult, because it's through that, overcoming differences, praying for one another, asking for forgiveness, 
that we really commune together with what it's supposed to look like. It brings healing within the church. It's admitting those faults and praying. Praying especially for our brothers and sisters who may differ from us. We pray for them and we pray for ourselves that we can be in the right perspective, the right posture before the Father that we can see through His eyes. Let's not all catch we are always right us. We confess when we fail, we forgive when others fail, and we pray for one another in church and for the church. Life is like a prickly pear. You know, there's no getting around the hard stuff. It's there. And you have to go through it to get to the good stuff, but it makes that sweetness taste so much better when you understand it. So we take the good and the bad as one. And we say, thank you, Jesus, for without you, we don't see the world for what it is, but for what it can be, if it has you. So may we pray that your spirit gives us strength, wisdom, and peace, that our eyes see through your eyes, our hands do what you need us to do, and our feet will take us where we need to go. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.